let's give it up for all the moms who cook for us and shop at Walmart for us. We love you, mamas. My mom was here first service, and so it was a lot of fun for me to be able to hug my mom and, and get a picture with her. And um, yeah, it's a, Mother's Day is a special day. And um, I, before I begin, I just want to say that, um, that we recognize that in this room there are... Um, Mother's Day is like a... It's kind of a mixed, a mixed emotion day for a lot of people. And so for some people, you know, you, you maybe, maybe you've lost your mom, and so she's not here for you to celebrate her today. Or uh, for some of you, maybe you lost a child, and so it, Mother's Day is hard. Um, and, and, and there's, there's mothers that, um, that, that maybe you, um, you aren't here with your kids today. You, you wish your kids were with you, but for just life, they're grown, and they have families of their own, and, and you just, they're not with you, and, and we recognize that makes today hard. And, um, and we know that there, you know, there's some that have struggled with infertility, and so today is just a really rough day. Um, because there's things that you'd hoped for that uh, just didn't didn't happen, didn't pan out the way you'd wanted, um, and um, and so we recognize you and we we honor you today. You know, I I, I honor the mom today that uh, maybe you raised kids that um, weren't your own. Maybe you live in a blended family, and so you're raising kids that aren't necessarily yours, but um, but you love them and you're a mom to them. And maybe the mom that uh, adopted children today, and we, we we honor you and we recognize you, or maybe. Maybe uh, just the, the foster parent that's in the house, and uh, and it's a lot harder than people know. And and we we honor you because you're making a real difference. And uh, and we honor the spiritual moms that are in the house. Maybe the people that kind of adopted adult kids, and you're like, no, these are these are my kids now. And you're just like loving them and leading them through life. Uh, we honor you today. So one more time, can we just honor all the moms that are here today? Yeah, yeah. If, if we could, if we could do anything for you, we would get you a florist job. And <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it whenever there's <laughs> kids uh, talking. It's the best. Um, my my mom was here first service, so I got to talk. I got choked up. So today, like this service, I'm just going to be like stone cold, no emotion, because uh, I got all that out first service, and. Uh, <laughs> Um, I love my mom. She, she's, a, she's a wonderful mom. And, and I recognize that there's people in the room today that you didn't have a great mom. And, um, and so it's not the same. And, and um, I, I just want to say today, you can change that. You, you, you might not be able to change what you experienced, but you can certainly change what your children and your grandchildren experience. And so if, like from this day forward, like change your family tree. Like make it better. Make it better. Um, my mom... Uh, she, you know, I, I grew up in the 80s, um, and uh, so my mom, she, she was given that, you know, that, that mom handbook that they handed out in the 80s, like all the moms got a handbook on how to be a mom, and um, that's what my mom had, so she would, she would always, you know, quote things out of the handbook, things like, uh, you know, if you're too sick to go to school, you're too sick to go play outside, um, that's in the handbook, so outside, um, to all my, my, my younger people, outside is, so there, if you, if you... <laughs> If you un, if you turn off your Xbox and you walk across the living room, there's this there's a part of the wall that is it's usually wood like this part like the rest of the walls like like drywall but there's a wood wall usually sometimes metal and it has this this knob thing on it. If you turn that and you step out out the wall, there's um, out it's called outside and outside there's there's trees there's blue sky there's there's just like, there's this green plants that grow like all together. Um, we call it grass. So go touch grass. Yeah. That's, it's in the mom handbook. And uh, my mom would also say things like, uh, when your dad gets home, he's going to find out about this. <laughs> you know, like, and it was the worst because as a kid, you're just like, dreading dad coming home. And uh, <laughs> poor dad, right? Like he worked all day and then he comes home and he just, he just wants to like kick back and do nothing. But he's got to become like the disciplinarian. Like it's the, it's the worst. Um, <clears throat> um, my mom would, another thing she'd read from the handbook was that, uh, that don't make a face like that because if you do, it's going to get, it's going to get stuck like that, right? It's, it's. But I had like a church mom. So church moms are another level. 
you, they, they just expect a lot out of their kids. I mean, I grew up in church. I grew up, uh, you know, if, if you're here and you have little ones, that's, that's who I was growing up. I, I, I grew up drawing pictures in the back of my Bible. And when I look at my old picture Bible that uh, had, like, I drew, like, scary things in there. So I'm, I'm, I'm surprised, like, the Lord, like, did something with my life, you know, <laughs> because I'm, like, drawing monsters and, like, people shooting each other and, you know, just, like, like ninjas or whatever it was. And, um, but that, that's how I grew up. And, uh, but church moms are on a whole nother level because church moms, they're, they're, they, they, they've not only got to like raise a kid, they got to make sure that they look like to everybody else that they're doing a good job raising a kid. You know what I mean? Uh, and so, so my mom would say things like, if, if you can't say something nice, don't. Yeah, that's right. That's what she said. So it sounds like some of you had church moms too. She said, if I want your opinion, I'll. Ask for it. Yeah, my mom would say, I'll tell you your opinion. That's, that's, <laughs> that's what she would say. My mom would say, when you start acting like an adult, I'll start, I'll start treating you like one. That's right. She said, she'd say, I've had it up to, yep. She said, I'm sick and, I don't get that. But she was always both at the same time, sick and tired. She'd say, my mom would say this. She'd say, if you don't stop crying, I'm going to, oh, some of you had real moms. None of this time out stuff, like a reason to cry, you know, you know, and when she was doing it, she would say something like this, like, uh, she's, she said, I love you, uh, but this is going to hurt me more than, yeah, that's a lie. Yeah. Let's train spots, mom. Let's say she would apply that, that, you know, the hand of knowledge to the seat of understanding is what, is what she would, she would train up a child in the way they should go, I guess. I don't know. Um, she was a little old school. And, um, but I, I love my mom. She's a, she's a sweetheart, even to this day, just a, just a sweetheart, a, 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 just a pleasant person to be around. My, my home um, was just a, a church home. My, my mom and my dad both lived for God uh, every day that I can remember. And in fact, I would say this, some of my core, like earliest memories in life are my mom praying. I think that's, um, you know, I, I don't think, my, my parents are both alive, and, and, I, and I don't think they're going to leave me with, you know, some, some big inheritance. Um, but I've already inherited something amazing from them. And it's, it's, it's these memories of what it looks like to have faith and to pray and to lean into God. And, and I would just say to somebody that's raising kids now, or maybe you've already got kids out of the house, but you're, you're kind of thinking through things like, Establish like this, like, no, you're going to, like, if you're going to remember anything about me, it's a mama knows how to get a hold of God. And um, that's, that's a powerful thing to leave with your kids. Uh, I just, my mama was, was, a, was a praying mama. And, um, you know, my, 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 my early memories, like I said, my early memories would be um, just her, her getting a hold of God. And she would pray. Like, my mama would pray. When, mom, when my mama prays, like, things happen, you know? Um, I, I remember when, when I was young, I was probably like 13 to 15, like a complete idiot. Did anybody else become like an idiot when you were like 14 years old? You're just like, no brains left, like just gone. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know why we have teenagers go to junior high. Like during junior high, we should just pull them out of school, like especially teenage boys. Okay, you're an idiot for a while. Go be, and then come back to school and learn. <laughs> like that's that's kind of, but that's how I was. I, I, I was just like going, doing my own thing. And, and I'm, my mom would come in my room at night and she would pray, pray over me. And, and there, there's many nights that I'd wake up and my mom would be praying over my bed while I was laying there. And, you know, and you're laying there, you're trying, trying to act hard. So you're not, ta- you know, not open an eye, but you can hear. And she's like, you know, Jesus, like you've got a plan for his life. Like, God, I, you, you, this is the son, son of my, my old age. Like you've, you, you, you've got a purpose in him. Like God, God, I know you've called him, like you, you called him to, to do something special. Like there's, there's, there's something on his life, Lord, and, and, and I know the enemy's trying to like get at him right now, but like I rebuke every devil that would come after my son right now, and she, she'd pray things like, like, like Lord, if, if he's going to walk away from you, I, I just pray that you take him right now. <laughs> like, 14-year-old me crawl out of bed like, oh, dear God, woman, like, stop, <laughs> stop praying. There, there's something powerful about the prayers and the faith of a mother. And, and we see this all throughout Scripture. Now, we believe that your faith should be your own, that your faith should not be a hand-me-down from someone else, you know, just kind of like just grabbing somebody else's faith and pretending like it's your own. It needs to be genuinely your own. But throughout Scripture, there is, there is like example after example of people whose faith had been passed down from family member to family member. This is why when we talk about God in the Old Testament, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and 
Jacob, because we're talking about a God that, that is there for generations. And, um, and I think a great example of someone who, uh, who is doing something for God, and a lot of what they were doing for God can be attributed to their mother. It's found in the New Testament. It's in the book of 2 Timothy. So um, it's not written by a guy named Timothy. It's actually written by the Apostle Paul. Um, and the, the Apostle Paul was writing to a young man named Timothy who was a leader in a church. And, and Timothy had a lot of things that he was working through as a young leader. So Paul would counsel him on how to lead people that are older than you, how to have confidence when you lead people who have more experience than you, right? Well, one of the things Paul tells them is, is don't, you can't let them despise you. They can't, they can't show contempt. Like, like God's doing a work in your life, and you have to be confident of that. And so he's, he's teaching him all these things about what it means to be an elder and a deacon in the church. And then, then he gets to it. There's a second book of Timothy that Paul writes him a second letter. And in this second letter, he begins by talking about the faith that Timothy has. He says this in 2 Timothy 1.5. He says, he says, I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother, Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. I, I, I love that the Apostle Paul does that. He says, he says Timothy, you're doing like a great thing. You're, you're a young, like motivated guy that's changing the world. Like really, like you're doing things in the kingdom of God. And I remember you for your faith, but your faith didn't just come out of thin air. Like, you've got some people in your life that were praying for you before you were smart enough to pray for yourself. you got some people that were fasting for you when you didn't know they were fasting for you. He, he says, there, there's some women in your life, Lois and Eunice, two women in your life that stood in the gap, that, were, that had faith that was just strong, living for God. And, and he's saying, Timothy, you, you, you're, you're experiencing sort of like the benefits of, of, a, of a longstanding standing. Faith in God. And um, I, I just love that when I read it because it gives me courage to know that there are times when I don't have what it takes. There's times when I don't have like deep enough wells, but I can know that there's, that I've got grandma and a great grandma and a mom that, that were praying before I was even a twinkle in my daddy's eye that like, that, that I would, that I would be able to like live for God and, and like do this thing called faith. And so, um, so today, I just want to um, talk about my mom a little bit. Is that all right? Yeah. Actually, I'm going to talk about a few women um, that mean something to me. And somebody's like, oh, you're going to talk about your family. Well, just sit me down. I have the microphone. Okay. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's, it's, it, yeah. Uh, next, th let's put up this first, this first. So this right here, this is my great-grandmother. Her name is Hattie. And great-grandmother -grand Hattie and, and the family moved to Twin Falls uh, early turn of the century uh, to be homesteaders, and um, man, she lived for God. I never met her. Um, some of my family members were privileged enough to have met her, and she, they were very poor. They didn't have a lot of money, um, but she had a fancy hat, <laughs> and um, so they they moved to the Twin Falls, Kimberly, Idaho is where they moved, but they, they had a, a homestead and tried to be farmers, but they weren't farmers and they didn't do well at that. And so they traded the homestead for a, a canyon out there um, and they turned it into a gravel pit and that's how they, they provided is through gravel pit. Grandpa was a better businessman than he was a farmer. And, um, and, and they still struggled. They, they just didn't have a lot of money. Um, but Grandma Hattie... At some point, she just really developed like this deep walk with God, faith in God, trust in God. And, um, and so I, a few years ago, I, I had a chance, we had a family reunion and we were in Twin Falls for the family reunion. And the people that now own the old place out there um, that, that Hattie used to own, um, they, they let us all come on there. So there's like, we just like, just steamrolled their place. There's so many of us in there. It was is great. So we're like walking around the old, the old canyon, and uh, it's called Rock Creek Canyon. And, um, and, and as we were there, I, I looked up on this old barn, and on the side of this old barn was a bunch of tack. 
Um, now, I'm, I'm from Alaska, so I'm not a horse guy at all. So I know the word tack. That's all I know. I don't know what all tack is. All you horse people know. But um, I saw all the stuff there. And I was like, oh, what's all this? And the gal that now owns the place, she said, you know what? All of that was there when we bought the place. She said, all of that horse equipment, all of that stuff, the bridles, all of that, that's, that's from your great-grandparents. And she said, you can, uh, you can take something if you want. And so I went over and... Um, and I took this old horseshoe that belonged to that horse. Um, it's, it's a studded horseshoe, so it's for wintertime. And why it's important to me is my, my grandma didn't have a lot of money, and they, they had a gravel pit. And one day, this horse broke its leg. And if you know anything about a horse, that, that's the end of the horse, <laughs> off to the glue factory, or in those days, dinner table. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> horse broke its leg, and they didn't have enough money to replace the horse. But my grandma believed in a prayer answering God. And so she walked over to the, the, the gravel pit, which was a pond, right? And so she goes over there, and she takes a bucket of water out of the gravel pit and walks over to this horse and throws the water on the horse and says, in Jesus' name. And that horse stood up and worked for the rest of its life. Yes. I, I, just, I just believe it's important, mama and daddy in the room, listen, it's important. If God has done something in your family, you must pass that on to your children. They need to know the stories of God coming through for your family. It, 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 otherwise, it's just something out there. But when they know the actual people and they know the actual story, it makes a difference. I've got some faith from this woman, Hattie, here. That, that is just like, I believe Jesus, in, in Jesus' name, anything can happen. Yeah. Uh, the next one here, um, show this next picture. This is my... my uh, <clears throat> I never met her. my dad's mom. Her name's Ida. And um, she, she got leukemia when my dad was a young boy. This is back in the days when they didn't have leukemia. Is, there's ways they can treat it now. But back then there wasn't, especially out in the middle of nowhere. And um, she, she had leukemia, and she was, she was dying. And a lot of my dad's early memories are of his mom dying. And um, she was down, I believe she was down to like 83 pounds or something like that. She was, she was done. And the people in the church that, went, that they went to church with, they all came together, and they said, hey, um, we're going to go down to the hospital. And these are the words they said, we're, we're going to push this thing over the hill. And so just a small church, like a small group of people from a church went to her hospital room when she was like 83 pounds and dying. My dad was just a little boy on the floor while these people are in there praying, laying hands on her, believing that God was going to heal her even when medicine couldn't. And God raised my grandmother, Ida, out of a hospital bed. She was healed of leukemia. Healed. There's just something that happens when you remember, like, God's done things in your world. Like, sometimes we just get so focused on the situations we're in right now that we forget context. Like, God has been pretty active for quite a long time. And we can take a minute and be like, no, he's actually, he, he's, he's been moving. Here's the next one. This is, um, this is my, my best of more. This is, this is my Norwegian grandmother. And um, best of more was beautiful. Uh, here's the next picture here. Um, this is Bestimore at 100 on her 100th birthday. <laughs> okay, so this is a funny story. So um, so the whole family's there. It's Bestimore's birthday. We, we're all having a great time with her. And then the next day, we went over to my aunt's house. Now, uh, my, uh, my aunt and uncle's house. But my, my other aunt is like the bossy family member. Anybody have that? Like the one that's like super bossy, like tells everybody what to do? Okay, that's one of my aunts. And so she, <laughs> she, 
she's, uh, she's like the whole time because she's, she's Bestimore's caretaker. So she's just like, you know, don't step on her hose because she's got like the oxygen tank. And she's like, don't step on Bestimore's tank here or the hose. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna suffocate grandma. Like there's constantly like, <laughs> like, grand, like the great grandkids, like, you know, don't get on Bestimore's lap. Like just the whole, the whole time, like doing this sort of stuff. And so it's the next day after the birthday party. And we, we go up to um, Longview to go uh, spend time with um, at my uncle's house with Bestimore. And so that, that next day, she's just, um, she's lethargic all day. So she's like sleeping and like tired and not really, she's not engaging in conversation. She's not eating. Like she's just like, so like you know, checking her pulse, make sure she's good, you know what I mean? And, uh, but she, she's good. And like, and you know, my aunt's like, don't step on her hose. Don't step on her hose. Like it's just the whole day, like she's just She's very out of it. And it was like, wow, that really, the sun must have really just taken it out of her, you know? And then at about four o'clock in the afternoon, my aunt says, you know, maybe, maybe it's about time to change Bestimore's tank, uh, her oxygen tank. And so she walks over and she goes, oh, her oxygen's not even on. <laughs> and she turns it on and, and, and Bestimore goes, <gasps> <laughs> He's like, oh, the grandkids are here. <laughs> mm. um, you know, when I look at her, I see someone who, uh, she moved to America when she was two, and uh, an immigrant family, and um, her, her dad was, was killed, I believe, that same year on the job, and um, so she grew up um, with some, some ends not being, you know, some loose ends of life, some questions, um, and, and uh, she, she, she was married, obviously I had a grandfather, because I'm here, but um, <laughs> grandpa was a good man, he was a good man, wasn't always a faithful man. And when I look at Bestimore, I can say, you know, e even when life didn't hand her the greatest circumstances, and even when she didn't experience the most faithfulness towards her, she was somebody with like this resolute faithfulness, even in the face of unwavering, like unreliable people. And um, that gives me confidence that I can, I can stand and I, I can just like live for God even if everybody else walks away. If everybody else like lets me down, I can, I can be like, no, I, I, I'm confident in who I am. And I get that from Bestimore. The next one is my mama. How in the world did my dad get that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Way above his league. That's all I'm saying. <clears throat> uh, so this is grandma with her cat eye glasses. Come on. Okay. Uh, uh, my mom, not my grandma. My mom. This is her now. This is my mom now. And, but here's one of my favorite pictures of my mom, um, because some of my best memories are being outside camping with my mom. We lived in, in the Yukon in northern Canada, and so we would spend a lot of time outside and just sitting around a campfire, and uh, I love this woman. Um, so I'm going to preach about some things that my mom taught me about faith. And I know somebody's like, no, you need to stick to the Word of God. I kind of am, actually. Paul is saying that Timothy's faith is based on stuff that he gained from Lois and Eunice. And so I'm just going to share something that I've experienced from my mom and kind of make this connection here. Is that okay? Good. I have the microphone. Okay. Um, <clears throat> first thing that my mom would say is this. She would, she would tell us this. This is something she would say every day when I was a young person. She would say, remember who you are and what you stand for. Remember who you are and what you stand for. My mom would say this every day when I went to go get on the bus for school, every day when I got out of the car, every day when I went to a friend's house to go play, anytime I left the house, my mom would say, remember who you are and what you stand for. And I, I, I tease with some of our staff members around here. I say, remember who you are and what you stand for. But the truth is there's so much there 
There's so much there. She, what she was saying is like, God has a purpose for your life, and don't forfeit it because of what someone else is doing. Like, like don't be willing to compromise your values just because it's popular or common or expected. Instead, remember who you are. You're not just anybody. And remember what you stand for. I'm here to tell somebody today that you need to remember who you are. You, you are a daughter of the Most High God. You're a son of the King. You are not common. You are not casual. You have a purpose from God. You have a destiny from God. And in order for you to reach that destiny, you're going to need to remember on certain days who you are and what you stand for. Because there will come days, entrepreneur, when you, will have, to, when you have to decide between doing what you stand for or compromising in business. I'm telling person that's married right now, there's going to come days when you need to remember who I am and what I stand for. There, there's going to be people in this room, even maybe you're a teacher in the educational system. I'm telling you, teachers, there's going to come a time pretty soon when you're going to have to decide, who am I and what do I stand for? Because not every opportunity is compatible with what you stand for. Not every opportunity is compatible with who you are. Child of God, hear me today. You must know who you are in him and what you stand for. Because when you know what you stand for, it limits the options. This is what vision is all about. People talk about, I need my life vision. I need my three-year vision, my five-year vision, my ten-year when you, when you have vision, it limits your options. That's what it does. And I'm just saying somebody needs to, instead of just, yes, get your three, your, make your vision board, do your thing. But what you really need is to know without a shadow of a doubt who you are and what you stand for. Because when you know that, it eliminates so many dumb options. I'm, I'm preaching like my mama is still here for second service. Because the truth is this, is that like you've got a calling from God on your life. I'm not the only one in the room with a calling from God. Like, yes, I have, feel called and I feel like I'm in my calling. But can I tell you that every single man and woman in this room is called by God for a purpose. And, and so, so many of us, we think living for God or Christianity is just, I believe in Jesus and I'm done. And, and because of that, we just live like really shallow faith lives. Can I just tell you, when you know who you are and what you're called to do and, and, and what you're called to stand for, you are unstoppable. Because callings and comfort zones, they, they, they don't go hand in hand. But when you know what you stand for, sometimes you can endure uncomfortable situations. You, you, you've got to have people in your life that, 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 that will, will stand there with you, that, that, that'll, that'll encourage you forward. This is why as a church, like, yes, come and be a part on Sundays, but you've got to have people to speak into your life. Like, like you've got to have people that, that, are, that are a part of your world that, that are, you know, Jesus called 12, 12 disciples around him. Why? Because, because part of this faith thing is doing life with other people. You've got to have people that can be like, son, I told you she was crazy the whole time. <laughs> I told you. You've got to have the I told you so's in your life, you know what I'm saying? But you've got to learn to listen to the I told you so's before the I told you. My wife is an I told you in my life. Like She always she sees things coming a mile away, and I'm like, no, nah, it couldn't be. And she's like, I told you. Let, let me say it like this. Uh, in, in this room today, I know that there are, there are people that are here today because your mom invited you. Uh, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't say, like, faith is your thing, but you, mom is your thing, and so you're like, I'm here for mom. Um, number one, good job. Take her out to eat. I've got, like, this low home. Uh, uh, take her out to eat after church and take her somewhere nice, like maybe step up for McDonald's a little bit, like so, somewhere... You know, take, take her somewhere good. 
and be like, Mom, whatever you want. Like, you paid, for, you fed me for 18 years, you know, I'm just kidding. Like, you can, you can take your pick, you know, whatever it is. Like, go take her somewhere to eat. But I want you to know this. The reason Mom invited you to church today is not because she wanted you to be in church on Mother's Day. Your mom invited you to church because she has an agenda. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> Screw your agendas. She has an agenda. She, she has a plan. And, and the plan is that in the same way Lois and Eunice passed their faith to Timothy, that that you would experience a, a, a change in your faith as well. Like that your faith would be genuinely yours. Well, it's not that she wants you to be here for an event so you can get a picture with her, although she does want the picture. It's that she really, she just sees value in living for God and she wants you to give it a shot. So I would just challenge you, son or daughter that's here visiting, being honorable to your mom. I would challenge you and say, let today be for mom. But make tomorrow, next week, come back and make it about you. Yeah. That's what mom wants. Yeah. You're welcome, mom. <laughs> my, my mom had this just really genuine faith that, that um, I, I would say is very practical in, in the way it, it applied to life. And Thomas Edison says it like this, that most people miss opportunities because it is dressed in overalls and it looks like work. Like, like saving faith doesn't cost you anything. Yeah. Faith in Jesus, it, it, it's all on him. Like, like, the way you're made right with God is all through the work of Jesus. But if you want to grow in your faith, it will cost you a little bit. Like, you're going to have to mature. Maturity, maturity requires something of you. And so some things that my mom had that I would say, like, when I, when I look at her, and I'm like, things she stood for. Remember who you are, what you stand for. Here's a couple of them. Number one, my mom never missed church. Never miss church. You want to know why? Because she understood something. She understood the parents that don't prioritize church attendance raise kids who don't value church attendance. Right. Well, let me say it another way. What she understood was that don't go to church parents don't make go to church kids. All right. <clears throat> Is that Okay. There we go. You, got the mic. I, you have the mic. Ah, <laughs> oh, Alan, it's Roger. <laughs> the next thing about my mom is this. My, my mama always had a time and place with God. She still does. Growing up, my earliest core memories are my mom praying, getting a hold of God, like getting a hold of God. My mom will pray every single day, like pr without fail. Like if there's one thing I know, I can walk in her house. You know when you walk in a room, you're like, people have been praying in here. That's how my mom's living room is all the time. And, and she'll be praying, and then I know this, that beside her, her chair, the chair she sits in, there's always going to be a Bible with this bookmark that says bread. Bible reading enriches any day. And my mama reads the Bible every single year. And, and, and I, can, I can count, like, like, like I can not count, I can remember so many times watching my mom read her Bible and then check off that day's reading. Right? Why? Because she understood something called, I need a time and place with God. If you want to grow in your faith, if you want to know who you are and what you stand for, you, you got to have a time and place with God. My mom gave sacrificially. I remember when I was young, we would, I remember we would go down to, to a trailer park near the house, and my mom would like hand out groceries to people um, that we knew in, in the trailer park. And, and as a kid, I kind of resented it because we didn't have a lot of money at that time. And so I would know that like our fridge wasn't like super stocked at the time. Not bad, just it wasn't like amazing. And I'm like, why are we giving away food? Like, I want, I want the Rice Krispie snacks. But it was because she understood when I have little, I'm going to give sacrificially. And then when, my, when God blessed my parents with money, they, they gave sacrificially on a different level. You, you want to know? Because like, that was just who they are. It wasn't, I'm going to wait until one day I have money in the bank, and then I'll be faithful in my finances. Then I'll, I'll, I'll be sacrificial in my giving. No, no, no. They were that way when they had nothing, and they were that way when they finally had something. It, it matters. The next thing my mom would say is this, she, she, I'm not she would say, but just something I observed in her, and that was that she was always ready to pray with a stranger. 
Like my mom's this little, timid, soft-spoken, quiet girl until she realizes that you need Jesus. And then it's like, it's on. Like there's nothing, there's nothing stopping mama. Like she's going, when my mom prays for you, her neck turns burgundy. It's like, I don't want to check your blood pressure right now. Would not be good. But like she prays and she, she's going to get a hold of God for you. And, and I can count. Just, there's countless times when we would be in a grocery store. My mom would meet somebody who was in need or someone that was drunk out of their mind. And mom would start talking to them and start praying for them right there. Why? Because my mom believed in a God that can really work in people's lives. Know who you are and what you stand for. You know, it's, it's interesting because um, Mother's Day is, is the second, nationally, it's the second highest attended Sunday uh, after Easter. It's because all the moms are like, kids, you want to know what I really want for Easter? I want, I want you to go to church with me. You know what I mean? And, and then Father's Day is like one of the least attended Sundays. Like, get your crap together, dads. You're like all out having a barbecue and camping, which camping's amazing. I'm all about it. <laughs> but moms, you're so amazing. Um, <laughs> here's, the, here's the next thing that my mom would, would share with me in my faith, and that's this. There's power in the name of Jesus. It's really simple, but it is a major life and spiritual hat when you understand that there's power by simply speaking the name of Jesus. Here's what it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be Saved. I'm just telling somebody today that if you feel like you don't have what you need in that moment and you feel like you don't have the prayers to pray, you can call on the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Uh, so many of us, we, we, we all go through difficult seasons in life. We, we go through heartache or financial difficulty or our kids go sideways or, or just whatever is going on in life. And what happens is, is we begin to forecast the future of our life based on what has happened in the past of our life. We, we begin to think that what did happen will always happen. And, and I think it's important for us to recognize patterns because patterns do help us predict future behavior. If you want to change some circumstances, start looking at the patterns of your life. But even with that said, so many of us feel trapped because we've made bad decisions in the past. And so we're just like, it's just always going to be like this. Like my marriage is just always going to suck. Like it's just my, it's just, it's always like, I didn't go to college when I had a chance. I'll never be able to go to college. Like we just kind of feel stuck in that spot. And I'm telling somebody today that you serve the kind of God who doesn't predict the future because of the past. Right? Because like our weathermen, they look at the past patterns and they can tell you what days are good. And so we're constantly measuring our days by what a weatherman says. Like, is it going to be super hot and calm? Because that's a good day to go shoot whistle pigs, somebody. <laughs> shoot whistle pigs. How could you? You're in Idaho. Okay. <clears throat> but here's the deal. You serve a God who stands up on the bow of a boat in the middle of a storm, and when he speaks, the winds and the waves stop. When Jesus speaks, the forecast changes. And I'm telling somebody today, there's power in the name of Jesus. If you feel like your marriage is just spiraling the toilet, ready to, I'm telling you, there's power in the name of Jesus. He can reach in and change some things, even though it looks like nothing will ever change. There's power in the name of Jesus. It, it, it says it like this in Luke chapter 10, verse 17. When the 72 disciples return, so Jesus has sent out 72 of his disciples in groups of two throughout the countryside to go proclaim the good news of God. And, and as they're doing it, they return. Here's them returning. Verse 17. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Do you, do you have night terrors? Do you wake up in the middle of the night terrified? Do, do you get stuck in dreams that are terrifying? I'm telling you, there's power in the name of Jesus. 
train yourself in the middle of your dream. You can train yourself to do this. Instead of trying to run from whatever it is that's scaring you, call on the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Even, even in your subconscious, the, the things that are tormenting you will, will be subject to the name of Jesus. Because watch this. Here's what the Bible says. It says uh, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You, you see that, right? It says, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven will bow, every knee on earth will bow, and every knee under the earth will bow. Even in your dreams, they bow. That, that's loud in the mic. Sorry for that. <clears throat> They bow at the name of Jesus. So I was, just, I was just in Uganda, and there was this strange custom that I, I didn't really feel comfortable with it, and I certainly do not endorse it um, for, for Americans. But there was, there was a tribe, and they told me before we got to the area where these people would be, they said, when you meet these people, um, the, the women might greet you strangely, just to understand what they're doing. Um, in, in this area, when, when a woman meets a, a man... Um, that they, they see has authority or some sort of significance, they will kneel down and shake their hand. Which, super uncomfortable. Okay, please do not do that. And that actually happened. I, I was sitting there like after church, I was shaking everybody's hand, and this, this one, like several came and like kneel. I'm like, dude, this is so weird. Like this would not fly in America. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> but what were they doing? Culturally, they're saying, I recognize some authority or significance here, and I'm just recognizing that. And that's what this passage says about the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven, every knee on earth, and every knee under the earth will bow at the name of Jesus to the glory of the Father. I'm just telling somebody today that when you feel stuck, you can call on the name of Jesus and things will change. When your child is sick, there's power in the name of Jesus. When your husband lost his job, there's power in the name of Jesus. When that diagnosis is hopeless, there's power in the name of Jesus. When you feel like you'll never be a homeowner in this economy, there's power in the name of Jesus. When you have that terrible night fear, there's power in the name of Jesus. When the car in front of you stomps on the brakes too quickly, there's power in the name of Jesus. When you're flying into Denver and the turbulence is too much, there's power in the name of Jesus. When the money runs out and the month is still going, there's power in the name of Jesus. When you run out of answers but you still got questions, there's power in the name of Jesus. Here's the third thing my mama would say. My mama would say this. She'd say, honey, you need the holy goats. You need the holy goats. Because my mama, she's a, she's a praying mama. She, she knows how to get a hold of God. Like, my mama's a tongue-talking, like, praying mama. Like, she, she go nuts. Like, if there's somebody you want praying for you, it's my mom. But when she was a really little girl, she would sit in church, and she'd hear the preacher talk about the Holy Ghost. And somebody today, you're like, the Holy Ghost, oh, no, this is going to get weird. No, it's not going to get weird. But we're actually, I'm taking a break right now to talk about moms, but we're in the middle of a series on the book of Acts. And so if you want to know more about the Holy Ghost, next week is Pentecost Sunday, so we'll talk about the Holy Ghost. But my mom always heard the preacher talking about the Holy Ghost, and she always thought he was talking about the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and so... So he was like a farmer or something, and so she, she decided she wanted, to, she wanted to see these holy goats one day, and so they, they went over to the preacher's house, and, and my mama like walks in the front door, walks straight through the house, out the back door, she's like, let me show me them holy goats. <laughs> but one day when she was in Bible school, she had an encounter with God that changed her life forever. She was filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the second work of the Holy Spirit. At faith, the Holy Spirit is in you. But there's, there's another work of the Holy Spirit where, where he radically transforms and, and fills your life like wind fills a sail. 
because of that, my mom, when she prays, she's, she's, she's praying with the holy goats. And that's my, that's my hope for you today, is that your faith wouldn't be just like a belief system that you hold, like, a, like I, I believe these certain things about God, but I, my, my, my prayer for you is that you would experience the power of the holy goats. And you change your life. And that's why it's really interesting because Paul says, remember the, the faith of Lois and Eunice. And then he says this, next verse. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. What is Paul saying? P- Paul's saying like, I, 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 your faith is not just like this thing that you inherited, but there's like a, the, the spiritual gift of God that you've got to like get some billows out and begin like blowing on that fire, like, like get it going. I'm, I'm telling somebody today, no, don't just rely on the faith that, uh, of, your, of your parents or your mom, but like the, the fan into flames like what God is doing. This is why as a church, we, we have got to be filled with the Holy Ghost goats like we got why Paul's saying because you you got to fan into flame like some things we just wait and we're like oh I just want to like learn all these like intellectual exercises and Paul's like no fan into flame the spiritual gift that's in your life I'm telling somebody today if you want to see real work of God in your life it'll happen when you stir it up when you fan the flames because you serve the kind of God that can reach into a black hole and grab a doorknob that doesn't exist and open a door and make a way when there was no way. Like he's the kind of God that doesn't work by the parameters of the people around us. When he works, he works. You might say, well, preacher, this this Holy Ghost thing makes me a little nervous. Totally get it. Makes me nervous too. Totally get it. But it's not about what I think. It's about what God thinks. And, And at some point, you've got to learn to trust God. Because as we go through the Bible, you're going to see it's real. Here's what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. If you have young children, make them memorize these two verses, 5 and 6. It says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean. Everybody lean. Do not lean on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Even when it comes to this thing. Understand that like, he's, he's, the, he's the God that's going to be faithful when I'm not faithful. Even when I, when I don't know which way he's going. If I trust him, I might not know which way he's going up the mountain. But if I trust him, he will make my path straight. And even when it comes to this issue of the Holy Ghost, I'm just telling somebody, trust him. 2 Timothy 1, 7. This is the next verse. It says it this way. Timothy, he says... You've got this great gift, spiritual, spiritual move in your life because of Lois and Eunice. He says, now fan into flame the spiritual gift in your life. And then he says this, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. This is cool because this is one of those verses we see quoted all the time by people. God's not given me a spirit of fear, but of love and power and sound mind or self-control. Contextually, It's connected directly to a mother's faith. Timothy, the reason you can have confidence in leading people more experienced than you, the reason you can have a sound mind and not be given over to fear is because you've learned something from a mother's faith. Because there's something about a mother's faith that is fearless. You want to see somebody that ain't scared of nothing? You get a mama mad and you watch what happens. And you, you get a mad mama praying for those kids. It doesn't matter what, like no demon in hell is going to stop a mad mama. And he says, don't be, don't be afraid. God's giving you, uh, doesn't, doesn't give you a spirit of fear, but of, of peace and love and, and a sound mind. I'm telling somebody today, like there, there's, there's power in a praying mom. There, there's power in like what God wants to do in your life. Band, would you come? Here's the last thing my mom would say. My mom would say this, I will always love you. I'll I'll always love you. And I know there's people in the room that you didn't hear that from your mom. Or maybe you heard it, but you didn't see it. But can I just tell you that you serve a God that, that can pick up right where that left off. You serve a God that 
will always love you. And, and, and the way he describes his infinite love for you is actually through the image of a mother. Watch this. It's in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15 through 16. It says, can, listen to this, can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Saying, can a woman who's holding a nursing child and she's also got a baby in her womb, is she going to somehow have to forget one to love the other? Have you ever experienced that? Like when I became a parent, that was kind of my question. I love my wife so much. How am I going to have enough love for this little kid? Am I going to divide the love a little bit? Maybe have to love my wife a little less? Am I the only weird one? Anyone else? That's how I felt. But then when that little boy was in my hands, I loved him. Like, it there was so much more love there than I recognized was in me to give. And then when you have another child, you think, well, maybe, maybe you just got like, going to have to balance. No. It's like for a mom who has a child that's nursing and a child in her womb, she doesn't have to pick which one she remembers and which one she loves. Because love is infinite. It doesn't need to be divided. And so God says, like, think about that for a second. Like a mom is not going to forget one of her children to love another. And then he says, even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Like that mom with a nursing child and child in her womb, she's not going to forget either one. But in the radical chance that she bonks her head somewhere and she gets amnesia or she gets sick and somehow has just forgotten her children or she gets, like something goes on in her life and, and she misplaces her affection somewhere in the radical chance that that could happen to a mom, God says, I will not forgive, forget you. And, and then he takes it a step further. He says, behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. That word engraved is the same word for tattoo, which means God has a tattoo <laughs> on his hand. Um, that, that was just for the sake of stirring things up, sorry. <laughs> but what's the point God's making here? The point he's making is like a mom is never going to forget her child. But in like the rarest case where she possibly does, he said, I still won't forget you. And then he's like this, and me, an all-knowing, all-loving God who will never forget you in the most rare, extreme case, if I was ever able to forget you, I wrote your name on here, so I will never forget you. God has a plan for your life. You are not too far. The Bible says this. You are not so far that God's arm cannot, is too short to reach you. You're close. You're as close as the mention of his name. Would you stand with me all across the room? Yeah. Jesus, we love you today. Holy Spirit, come in this room. Holy Spirit, have your way. I wonder if there are people in this room today that for you, you recognize that you, you need to get right with God. You recognize that you've, you've wandered away from him in some way or maybe you've never been close to him and you recognize you need to get right with him. What he's looking for from you is not, not belief, like I believe in the tooth fairy. It's not what he's looking for. What he's looking for from you is allegiance. Like I will, from this day forward, I will alter my life to be able to stand based on who I am 
and, and what I stand for. Like, like God, God's looking for you not to just say, I believe in him, makes me feel better so I can go have lunch. Instead, like, I, I will, I'll believe in him like I will be faithful to him. If that's you in the room and you recognize God calling you up to be faithful to him, here's what I'm going to say. Instead of putting a hand up, I'm just going to ask you to come forward. God calling you to be faithful to him. If that's you, make your way forward. Yeah. That's great. That's great. The prayer team, if you'd come on down. Yeah, that's good. Let's go. And here's what I'm also going to say. So we've got some up here that are, that are committing a faithfulness to God. But I want to open it up to others. I want to say this. If you need prayer, if you need a healing in your body, if you need God to intervene in your marriage, if you need God to, to work a miracle in the business that's not working out right, I'm just saying God can do it. He can do it. So that's you, and you want prayer. I just want you to come on down, and we're going to pray for you. So right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we, we stand in, in solidarity with you. We stand with allegiance to you alone. Lord, not faithful to another, not calling on the name of another, but Lord, we stand faithful to you. Lord, we repent of the sins in our life that don't please you. And we turn away from them now. We believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So we say, be the Lord of our life. Lead us and guide us. We trust you today. Why don't you come down and pray? Ben's going to sing, and as they do, if you want to pray, receive prayer, you're more than welcome to come on down and just see what God might do for you today.